Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Session Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love group and is part of the Education in Love series. In the Facing My Resistance to Faith presentation, Jesus encourages us to go through the process of emotionally removing our resistance to faith in God, God's love, God's truth and God's laws, and the need to take action to develop more faith in order to use our will in a loving manner. Recorded on the 8th of March 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. That song was by Jewel, I think I got that one right. <laughs> Have a little faith in me. Nice song. It's the theme song of that movie Phenomenon, you remember that? Those of you who have seen that? Um, John Travolta? Uh, yes. Yeah, it's good, eh? Okay, there's a few missing, I'll wait, to wait for... Have a little faith in me. Have a little Probably. <laughs> when it comes to faith, you're already resistive, so that's a good start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or a bad start, yeah. We've all had a bad start. Although, we'll talk about that as well in a minute. I'll just wait for a few more people to come back and. All right. All right, so the subject of this discussion is uh, facing my personal resistance to faith. Now remember the two days we're, we're looking at facing our personal resistance to a number of different subjects, but we're, what we're trying to do now is look, rather than sort of analysing the resistance, now what we want to do is start looking at how do we go about feeling our way through this resistance? How, how do we get rid of this resistance is what we need to address. Because if we don't get rid of the resistance, then it's highly likely we're not going to use our will to love or to change. So it's very important that we address the resistances that are within us. And one of the primary resistances within us now as adults is this resistance to the quality of faith. I find it interesting, you know, with this quality of faith because... The quality of faith is quite frequently present in children, um, but very infrequently found in adults. And uh, in fact, children generally have a what we call a childlike trust of their environment until their environment proves to the child that the child cannot trust. Before that time, the child will generally trust. That's why it's a lot easier talking to a group of children about a subject than it is talking to a group of adults about the same subject. Children are much more open to even trusting that what they're hearing is true from a person who's in a state that they feel is a state that knows more than they themselves know. Now, of course, for most children, that means everyone around them knows more than they know generally. Um, but unfortunately, um, because they've been closed off to God, they become very, very dependent upon the adults that know things around them rather than on God uh, first. And then the beauty of being dependent on God first is you can check all the things you learn from other people with your relationship with God. So you go, well, that person told me this, but God's telling me something completely different. Right? So therefore, what that person's telling me mustn't, mustn't be true. And if a child had that connection, then it would be quite easy for the child to determine what is true and what is not. But unfortunately, because we've, as we've already discussed, we've been quite closed down to our connection with God by lots of external events that all happened usually before our life even began. You know, so we're talking about the multi-generational sin now that's being carried down through the generations. We have a predisposition to not trusting God, but trusting our human parents and human adults. And of course, as we've learned already, getting an education in love from people who know nothing about love is the blind leading the blind, which is eventually what happens. But what I'd like to do is just read out a couple of definitions of love to you. 
The first definition comes from Afra, from the book from, written by Robert James Lees called The Gate of Heaven. Many of you have read that book, but I'll read what his definition as faith is. Faith is what may be called a telemicroscopic faculty the soul discovers in the depth of being, which, when pressed into service, penetrates and illuminates the interior darkness and enables the soul to live in the future as if that future were already present. So that's his definition. The Bible has a definition too it was, it, that Paul wrote. Um, Faith is the ex assured expectation of the things hoped for, the evident demonstration of realities, though not beheld. So Paul sort of focused faith on areas of your life that you couldn't see but could see the outcome of. So it's a bit like the wind, isn't it? Like we, when we feel there is a... We now know, humans now know, that a differential in pressure on the planet causes like the, the atmosphere to flow from the area of high pressure to the area of lower pressure. Right? which causes wind. Now, we don't see it, but we see its effects. And so we have complete trust that there is such a thing as wind because we see and feel its effects. We can feel it on our face. We can see it in the trees. When the wind gets really bad, like a, a large differential of pressure, like a cyclone, we can see its destructive force and power. And so we know it to be real, a real phenomenon, even though it's something that we cannot ourselves actually see. We only see the effects. And the same applies to faith, really. We, we can measure the cause and effect of things and therefore know that a cause must be something that we cannot see. But it is having an effect that we can see. And this is what faith, faith builds upon those experiences. It builds upon the experiences of seeing things, the results of things that we can't see, actually see the physical cause of. Now, scientists has been, science itself has been driven by the knowledge of the things it can't see to a large extent. And this is why they've you know, had, like, made devices such as the electron microscope to, to drill down into things that we can't see. They're too small for us to see and to drill down in them and to see them. And then there's other things that we can't see, like en energetic forces that we know are present and we can only see the effects. Now, many of you, when you were children, would have done that magnet thing where you, where you get a magnet, you put it under a piece of paper and then you sprinkle some filings on top. And what did you see? You saw the lines of force. They all aligned themselves, didn't they? So if you had your magnet, like so, you know, with a north and a south, and when you sprinkled the filings, they sort of circled around like this, didn't they? You remember that? Most of you would have tried that. that, that. And th these are lines of force that you can't see. But when you see the effects, you can now see and therefore have faith in them. And in fact, many of you have complete faith in them. Complete faith. Um, any, any, most of our life now is driven by the flow of electricity. You have complete faith in it, in, in, in all of its form. In fact, every single day, many times, you put your life in its hands. That's how much faith you have in it. And yet it's something you can't see. So these are, there are all these physical things you can't see, but you have complete faith in them. Right? And this is what I find quite ironic, is that we even base our very life on a whole heap of things physically that we have faith in that we could have never personally seen. But when it comes to emotional and spiritual life, we don't do the same thing. We completely ignore doing the same thing, in fact. And, and in fact, we are so illogical that we even use the concepts like, oh, but nobody knows, and we tell ourselves nobody knows, and it, it can't be measured. And yet, really, each law of God can be measured. Everything, the effects of every law of God are able to be measured. 
every single one. And this is something we'll come to understand when we talk about law a couple of uh, sessions, you know, in a couple of months' time. It's near the end of the year. But what we need to come to understand is that, f yes, when it comes to physical matters, we obviously have a great deal of faith in a lot of things that we cannot see, don't we? Yep. In fact, many of you are giving me your hard disk drives and I'm copying electronic signals that you can't see onto those drives and, and the only reason why you can see them is you can see its effect right? you, by watching a video. Right? So there's heaps of things every single day that you benefit from that you actually can't see but you know to be true and therefore you can have complete trust and faith that you're able to act upon them and even place your life in their hands. Interesting, huh? But when it comes to spirituality, morality and emotions, we have very little faith. And when it comes to God, God's goodness, God's truth, we have very little faith. And yet, faith is a quality that is quite established within us about other things. Right. So the question then becomes, what is the reason why I have a lot of faith to the extent that I'll place my life in the hands of things that I cannot see that are physical, and yet when it comes to morals and emotions and, and spiritual inf information and even the very existence of God, I decide to choose to have no faith whatsoever. What causes me to make this internal choice and decision? It's a question, isn't it? You want to, a few comments there? So we come down to Felix and then on that side, right up the back, if we have the Alex. Thanks. Well, it would be um, what, uh, I'm just following everybody else's attitude because I was just used to it. Yeah, so that's partly it, isn't it? Society generally does not accept faith in certain things, so therefore I'm not going to accept faith in those same things. So that's one thing certainly that drives us greatly. Yeah, Alex? Um, with the story that you told in the first session of the first day, yep. um, when your dad was trying to oppress his stuff upon you, mm -hmm. but uh, so it's a question of faith, like what within you... Um, rejected that and felt like no I I can trust the good spirit with me or or God or because yeah. well I can feel I could feel you see the key was being sensitive emotionally so I could feel that the benevolent being that I was connecting to whoever that was right I could feel that person was more loving than my father was he had nicer feelings than my father did and right. he was more loving than my father was and so I trusted him more than I trusted my father. Does that make sense? And you trusted your emotions in that? Well, feelings. Uh, yes, I, I trusted my emotions and feelings, but this is the thing that all of you need to learn to do. You need to trust your real emotions and feelings, not, yeah. not the ones you manufacture, not the ones that you... Yeah. But, but your real ones, right? And this is very difficult when there's a lot of injuries. Bearing in mind in the first century, I didn't have a lot of injuries, so therefore, you know, I, I could trust... The feeling I was getting from one creature, if you could call it that, was benevolence, love, and, and a lot of truth that I, could, that I had already established through my relationship with that person to be true. And then my father's telling me a whole heap of what he believes is true, but, but which I can see is actually totally untrue. And, 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 and that other person, that other benevolent being, was telling me that it's untrue even if I didn't know myself through my own experience, mm. right? So that's what caused me to, to reject what was being shared with me by the world because I'd already been shared the same thing from uh, uh, something on the same subject from a different source that was saying something completely different. That makes sense, Alex? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is why it's so important to connect to God because God can share with you truth and then that truth, once it's shared with you, you can test it to see whether it is true or not. Just like you've tested every single day, you test things that scientists have discovered to be true that you have no knowledge of whether they're true or not until you try them out and see. 
right? You do it every day. It's something you do every day physically. And what I'm suggesting is we need to start doing this emotionally and spiritually, not, not just physically. Or I'm, saying, I'm saying the beauty of the way God's created the universe is what you do physically only has to be applied to what you do emotionally and spiritually. And then you'll start progressing. Does that make sense? Yeah. And when you think about it that way, it's like encouraging, isn't it? Like you're already doing it, but you're just doing it with all the things man's discovered. But, but you're, you're already doing it and you're already trusting your life in that. You do it every day. So I don't see what the difference is between what I'm proposing and what you already do, with the exception that it's to do with your emotions and your spiritual development, your future life, rather than, and in fact, in my mind, that's more important. Um, and surely it'd be more important to you. But but you're already doing the same thing in your physical life, so I don't see any problem with you doing the same thing in your spiritual life. There must be, there must be just reasons why you don't. And Felix has pointed out one of them, and that is the rest of the world doesn't. <laughs> right? But that's not the only reason why. So what, what might be some other reasons why, do you think? Right? If we come down to Marie here, and then down to David here. So keep, leave your hand up, Marie. That's it. As soon as... Um I didn't feel safe as a child. I became self-reliant, like before three. So yeah, as soon as your safety is threatened, faith is not not an option. Yeah, so I can't agree with that either. My safety gets threatened every day, and I still have faith. So I, I don't I don't see that as being true. Um, and in the first century, my safety was threatened all the time, <laughs> and I still had faith. So I don't see I don't see the linkage there. Does that make sense? And certainly it can be a linkage you've made and then justified, but I don't actually see that as the real reason. Does that make sense? If we come down to David down the front and then to Cecily up the back there. So. Uh, I see there's a massive lack of using logic in the situation. Okay, so in other words, uh, we, we have a distorted sense of what our, our reality and we're selectively choosing what we're going to put faith in and what we're not going to put faith in. Yeah, exactly. Basically. And yep. when a certain you know, feeling sort of comes up instead of being able to look at it logically, yep. you, you know, we just completely go with the projection that's happening in the moment or yeah. you know, what you're feeling internally. Yep. Yeah, so, so you can see our unhealed emotional state drives our logical ability, or we could say our illogical ability uh, is, is driven by our unhealed emotional state. So, so we're selecting ha when we're being logical and when we're not. And, and the, the reality is, if, a, if we got a person from 500 years ago and all of a sudden he time travelled and he just dropped here, bang, like that, and then we started saying, well, come on a plane with us tomorrow, you know, he'd be a bit freaked out, right? Never seen such a thing, doesn't have trust in the electronics that's driving it or the, or the other functions that are driving it. And, and, but once he sees it go, he'd probably jump in there with you, wouldn't he? Once he sees that it actually works. He'd probably have to see one or two take off first. And then he'd go, yeah, no worries, I'll, I'll give that a go. But, but, um, and what, so what I'm saying is that there, historically, mankind have had huge amounts of inventions come up that nobody imagined before that invention, ever, before that invention was created that w that particular thing would be possible. And yet someone had faith that it could be possible based on the laws they'd already discovered. And then as a result of that, they created something. It can become possible. So that tells me that all of these so-called emotions that drive these illogical belief systems that we have can all be sorted out. Mm. But you're right. The, the emotional state has a large bearing on our inability to be logical and our inability to have faith. Mm. Yep. Who are we over here? Seth, thanks. I was going to say because I choose to honour my fear and my false beliefs. Yes, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute, actually, Sess. Yeah. Can I just uh, stop you now? We, I just want to move, move forward a bit. The, so we, we've established in this discussion that we already put faith in a lot of things we can't see. We just don't do it with emotional and spiritual things. We avoid it in, with emotional and spiritual things. And as the guys have pointed out, the, the world's view of what doing it, what's acceptable, has a large impact and bearing on our 
on our decision to do that and also our emotions have a large impact and bearing on our decision to do that all right so how are we going to get beyond our beyond this resistance that we have that's the real question and it, and it becomes very plain doesn't it that basically we're going to have to feel some emotions <laughs> aren't we we're also going to have to feel our false beliefs aren't we and see them as actually false otherwise we're going to assume they're true and keep on acting upon what we believe to be true so these are these are key things that we need to choose to do but what I wanted to do for a moment is to focus your attention on why we choose to have a lack of faith, why we choose to resist faith. Right? So if we examine that, that reasons, those reasons, just rub that out. So if we go, why? Now there's two there's two issues here. Firstly, the question is why do we lack faith right now in these emotional and spiritual things? But then there's also the a related question which is why do I resist developing faith? You know, it's one thing to already now have a lack of faith myself isn't it that's one thing uh, it's quite another as to why i choose to continue to stay in that condition uh, the two the two really separate questions aren't they in a way related but separate so why do we lack faith well let's have a look at why usually during our childhood what happened was this we were promised things which which were not fulfilled the promises were not fulfilled whether that be mummy saying something to us that finished up not being true and daddy saying something to us that was not true or the school teacher saying something to us not true or other children saying things that are not true and and we trusted them and then we trusted them to uh, but but in the end they didn't happen and then we felt a terrible feeling of disappointment but rather than feeling the feeling of disappointment what did we do with it we stored it up as a protective layer in order to have to examine the next thing that we were promised and the more promises that were unfulfilled that happened in our life the more we finished up storing up this disappointed emotion to the point now where now we feel disillusioned with whatever is promised and we feel that it's not logical to have any faith in what people promise Right? and because with technology and other things like that that particular thing did not happen in other words with technology the things we're promised generally come true right they're established to be true and then we use them and we use them again and like right 100 years ago or a couple of hundred years ago when the phone was created initially nobody believed it was possible but after a while everybody started using them and by the mid 1920s you know the rich, all the richies had one and then by the mid 1940s pretty much everyone in a developed country had one right and now you carry two or three of them <laughs> with you generally you know one family might have five of them all on them uh, all carrying them around and and you with confidence pick them up and dial a number and, and expect to get <laughs> exactly the person that you've dialed on the other end do you not you've got complete faith that that will happen so you've got complete faith in technology the things that are physical but when people are involved now you don't have as much faith do you can you see that and that's caused by this constant thing that's happened over the period of your life that there's been disappointment and disappointment here disappointment there can't trust this person here can't trust that person there but but what's happened you did not release the emotion 
So what you do is you take that emotion into your next interaction and into your next interaction. And then the more interactions you have where there is a failure on the part of a person to provide any evidence of faith, the more you take that into the next interaction. So you end up with a build-up of emotion inside of you that says, don't trust people. Isn't that not true? All right. Now, interestingly enough, we haven't had a relationship with God, but we don't trust God. So where does that come from? Well, obviously it comes from the fact that we have a build-up of emotion about trusting people. <laughs> Because we've not yet experimented with our trust in God at this point. So again, we're imposing our relationship with people on God. We basically are presuming that God's going to be the same as the people that we've interacted with. We're going to have the same feelings. He's going to promise things and not fulfill them and so forth. So that's why we lack faith. right? Now pretty much everyone on the planet could say they've had those experiences, right? Right. But that doesn't answer this question. <laughs> Why do I resist developing faith? Does it? Just because we lack it, if we know we lack it, and we know that it's probably not that logical when it comes to God to lack it, and yet we refuse to develop it, there's got to be other reasons that cause our desire to not develop it is what I'm suggesting to you. What are those reasons? If we go to Anada and to... Um, maybe straight across to Joanne after that. Yep. Um, I feel it's because we would have to feel all those emotions from our childhood, from those people. Yes. We would rather resist that. So, no, so number one is... I'm going to have to feel all of this added up disappointments. Yeah. Now, a lot of our disappointment isn't just disappointment in terms of a brief sort of emotion either, is it? It's like, it's pretty major sadness in, inside of us, isn't it? So, basically all of my disappointments, if I could put it in brackets there, large amount of sadness is going to have to be felt, isn't it? And on top of the sadness, there's probably some, there's probably some anger right? as well. That's probably going to have to be felt too before I can even get to my sadness. So most people go, well, hang on a sec, you're asking me to feel a whole heap of stuff without there being any seeming, at this stage, any seeming potential good that can come of it. Right? and be bloated if I'm going to do that I'm not going to do that I'd rather just store it all inside of me and just carry it on with me for the rest of my life that's what I'd rather do and so we do that's what we do we just store all this disappointment <sighs> and, we, and, and we're exhausted by this disappointment but the reality is we carry it around so much we can barely trust the people we say we love the most let alone anybody else isn't it? Barely trust even the people who say I love the most. So, so one reason why I resist developing some faith is that it means that I'm probably going to have to feel a whole heap of emotion and I really don't want to feel that emotion. That's the choice I've made. I've made a choice to resist feeling of emotion that, that is linked to my development of faith. Right? So that's a big, big thing. Anything else you can think of? Uh, we're over at Joanne. Yes. Um, I find that I resist that so much that I actually set people up to disappoint me without intentionally thinking through it. I find I accidentally maybe do things that set people up. Yeah. So How many of you find yourself doing that at times? Because it is a common thing pretty common thing. Uh, why do we set people up to disappoint us? It's quite obvious, isn't it? Because it reinforces the fact that we shouldn't have to have any faith. That we, sh you know, it reinforces our desire to not have to deal with the issues. Yeah. Yep. So Jana, and if we go up the back, yep. Um, just in I can't see your name, sorry. 
Trina, is it? Thanks. Um, you pray for things and you pray and pray and pray and yep. they, they don't happen, then you give up. So how is, how, how is that resisting developing faith? Because you, you're giving up, you just feel so hopeless, you give up. Yeah, you see, see, for me, if I'm praying for something and I'm not receiving it, I would be making the assumption that any, if God is good, uh, and I always make that assumption, that, and I'm not receiving what I think I'm praying for, then, then it probably indicates that what I'm praying for is not as good as I think it is. Does that make sense? That's, does, that would yeah. be my assumption. So I, I don't sort of see the linkage there uh, between those two conditions. Does that make sense? It does, yep. I do see that we may have asked people for things in our past that have caused us to have that particular emotion, but I can't see how it relates to God because if I'm not receiving things from God, then to me it means that God doesn't want to give them. A and if God doesn't want to give them, there must be a reason. And I always think, well, God's always got reasons for being loving, so I presume that the, re the reason is loving rather than presuming it's unloving. So the question I need to ask you in return is, why do you presume that what you're asking for is loving? Do you see what I'm saying? Because if, if you presume that what you're asking for is loving, but you're not receiving it, then I can understand why you're disappointed. Right? But, but, if, but it, the way I look at it is, if I'm praying for something and I'm not receiving it, then I presume that what I'm asking for is not loving. Because I know God's going to give it if God can. If it's in harmony with love and truth, God will definitely give it. So, do you see what I'm saying? I do. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Jada, thanks. Um, I was just going to ask does it come back to, um, like, if we develop faith, our life's probably going to could change significantly and we don't want to do that? Yes, there's going to be significant, significant, oops, changes. So, just uh, let's actually. It's bigger than significant, isn't it? It's everything <laughs> will change. Now, for the majority of us, how do we feel about that? Well, we've established already last couple of days, we're not happy with that. <laughs> so, and we know that everything will possibly change. So, so therefore, it's better to not have any faith that anything will, so that way I can avoid the whole process of change. Right? And this gets again down to my exercise of my will, does it not? I am choosing to not change, and I know that if I have faith, I'll probably change, and so it's better to not have faith. That way I can have doubt, and while I have doubt, I don't have to change. I can just talk about things. And many of you do this, I notice, you talk about this truth, that truth, this truth, that truth, this truth, that truth, right? In, in your interactions with each other and also with others that, that are not here, um, but you don't actually engage them, you just talk about them. Well, that's a person who has not got the faith to actually do them. So, so, but why are you talking about them with others then? Isn't that a bit hypocritical? Trying to encourage others to do what you haven't done? Isn't that hypocritical? Yes, it is. But why do you do that? Oh, well, that's also because I want a whole heap of other people to come along on the ride with me before I do it myself. That's why I want it done. I want, I want us all to join together and do it as one rather than me have to do it alone. Right? So there's a whole heap of reason for that as well. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, big, big point that. Everything's going to have to change. Right up the back, thanks. The people around me don't have faith in God and um, they don't have um, anything to support me because I feel pretty weak about it. So. so you're really saying, I'll be different. Yeah, and scared of being different because when you've been different in the past, you've been, I've been, you know, belittled or shot down or... Yeah, troubled. people have, in the past, people have died for being different. Mm. Yeah, all through the dark ages, if you were a medium, you got strung up, right? You, you were, if they find out, you're going to die, right? All through the dark ages, if it, generally if you were a homosexual in a Christian religious area, then uh, you would have been killed pretty much immediately, right? 
So being different, very dangerous, right? It even threatens your life being different. So, so we have these fears that are based really terrors about being different. Most of us want to conform to the world. But as I've said to you a few days ago, conforming to the world is, is actually a pretty bad thing because it means that you're never going to get any further than what the world is. So conforming to the world is never going to make your life happier than what the world has. The happiness that the world has will be yours. The suffering the world has will be yours. The pain the world has will be yours if you conform to the world. So, so logically, it's not a very logical thing to do, but, but because of the fears, particularly from the past, whenever we were different, we, the minimum generally is that we were ridiculed and often violently punished. And historically, we have spirits around us who have been murdered for being different. So, so naturally, there's a lot of fear about being different, which is obviously motivating our choice and decision. Now, can you see already what we're building up here is a series of feelings, series of emotions that are preventing us from developing faith. So we all lack faith, right? Because of this, for pretty much the same reasons, we all lack faith. But resisting developing faith is an act of our will. Now, this might not have involved our will very much, right? This, this might have involved the will of others and how the world thinks and everything else, why we lack faith. But why we resist faith does involve our will. That, that is something we can change. We can choose to change this. And we're not. We're not choosing to change it because we have investments in emotions from the past staying within us, which actually are very harmful to us, actually. They stop us from doing a whole heap of very good things with our life, but, but we hold on to them and we choose to hold on to them. So what I would like to get, get you to understand from this particular discussion is the reason why we lack faith is different to the reason why we resist developing it. And the reason why we lack faith while it might be tied to a whole heap of childhood events, the reality is we only lack faith in certain things. We don't lack faith generally in physical things, do we? So we have faith in physical things to the point that we will trust our very lives with, with those particular things we have faith in, but we lack faith in anything to do with people, emotions, etc. Anything related to where we were disappointed. That's where we lack faith. Now, that's, that's the case for the majority of people on this planet. We have a large amount of faith in scientifically physical, physical things, but we have a large amount, lack of, amount of doubt in people, lack of, lack of trust in people, lack of faith in people. That's our condition. But that still doesn't answer this question, why do I resist developing faith in God? Because right. God's not people. Right. And that, that gets down to having to feel a whole heap of emotions. But you know what we're not seeing? Is that choosing to not feel emotion is actually out of harmony with love, so therefore a sin. Choosing to not change is out of harmony with love of self and love of others, therefore n sin. Choosing to be the same as the world is choosing to be like the world and the world is sinning so that means we will sin so we're basically saying that i'd rather sin than develop faith that's what we're really saying i'd rather sin than develop faith and can you see that choice has to change 
if we're going to have any faith and, and therefore we're, you know, stop being resistive to the development of faith. <coughs> you see that? Is there any questions about that? Hmm? Joy, thanks. Um, does it uh, presuppose that I want to have a relationship with God, otherwise there's no need to develop faith? Oh, I agree, yeah. Did I... I'm going to put my razor... Oh, there it is. Yeah, I agree. It does presuppose that you want to. Um, there's little point in developing faith in God if you don't want to have faith in God or a relationship with God. So, of course... This does depend, but, but remember we said at the beginning of our discussion this week that if we don't have a relationship with God, then we're not connecting with anyone with a higher source. So what's going to be a result of that? We're going to get the world's... So there's the negative effect, if you like, of not choosing to develop faith in God and not having a relationship with God is the fact that we can't receive an education from God, which means that we then our only education about love can come from the world and what's the results of that well what the world's getting so so yes you can choose it but is it wise is it wise to not choose this is it wise to choose this with lack of faith no it's not and it's not wise to remain in a state where you don't want to develop it because in the end you'll just get what the world gets so it makes no sense to me to do it but yes god's given you certainly the the will that you can exercise so that you do that but but the world is already demonstrating the result of will exercised in that direction yeah if we come down to feel it thanks with the second question um isn't a really big one uh that um refusal to actually make a test say of, of what you say about a, a particular law or something and really test it out and experiment yeah, yeah it is okay, a refusal no. to experiment so yeah. that's a refusal to make mistakes isn't it yeah refusal to make mistakes yeah. experiment and make mistakes yeah so why do we why are we worried about making mistakes um just that oh it'll all go bad <laughs> well well it's more than that usually like what does the world do to you when you make a mistake yeah, punish, punish you. Man, you get hammered, don't you? Yeah. Right. What God doesn't hammer you when you make a mistake. The law is already in operation, and the mistakes happened. God doesn't hammer you further for doing it. But the world has this terrible view. You make a mistake, and man, you hear about it for the rest of your life, don't you? <laughs> That's what yeah, we're avoiding. Yeah. <laughs> we're avoiding the attack. Yeah. Yep. So, so one of the reasons why I resist developing faith is really because of the avoidance of attack. But um, I know when I experimented, um, yep. it was also like a fear that um, of of like if if I get it wrong, then um, and if I'm wrong with my experiment, which I was, I turned out to be wrong. Yeah. Um, so I learned something uh, that you know the uh, law of you know the the results would be bad, like you know the law of compensation would be too bad and it's like I'm fear of even making a mistake with God yeah, yeah I, but I did do it anyway isn't that really again like yeah. being afraid of mummy or daddy punishing yeah. you in the end well because God doesn't punish you the laws already adjust you so if you're already out of harmony with the laws of love then the laws are already attempting to adjust you where you are right now is as bad as it's going to be <laughs> does that make sense um, it can't get worse unless you choose purposefully to to do further things out of harmony with love. Well, I chose to do something which I thought was getting around my addiction and in harmony with love. And I, and but you did that because in your soul you believed yeah. that what was being said to you wasn't true. So th that belief was already there and you were, mm, the law okay. was already operating on that belief. You yeah. were already getting the results Just of breaking got, the I law. I got it quicker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by choosing it, that's the beauty. Okay. You, you get to learn the truth better. But uh, this is a big okay. issue. We're afraid of attack either from God or from others. We're just afraid of getting punished for the choices that we're making. Yep, very, very big problem. If we go up to... Um, 
Maxine, thanks. Yeah. And then down to Tara. Just. Yeah. Um, I was raised in the Catholic system belief. Um, not that we went to church or anything, but Mum was quite strong with that. And yep. Is it? And would it be a lack of faith because of the religious beliefs have um, confused us with? I don't think they've confused you. I think what they've done is they've been imposed upon you in a very unloving manner and that, that has made you angry rather than confused. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, when, when we get belief systems that are obviously unloving from a child's perspective imposed upon the child, the child grows up feeling a lot of resistance <laughs> to those belief systems as a result. You know, this is why many of you have rejected Christianity, right? Because, it, because it's been forced upon you as a child, right? which is actually breaking one of God's laws, the law of free will, not, not being able to make your own choices and decisions. Right? You often also observe hypocrisy in religion, where you know, they say one thing but do another, where your mum says one thing and she does another. Right? And then, of course, we get angry about that. How dare she do that? Right? She says one thing, does another. Jeez, that's not very nice. And... And she's blaming the religion for things or blaming God for things when, when she's saying, I've got to love God. And then she, then she says she loves God, but she doesn't seem to love me very much. And, you know, so we have a lo whole heap of things happen to us when we're brought up in a religion which demonstrate the hypocrisy of our parents. And then, of course, we get quite angry about it. But because we're not allowed to feel our anger about it, we call it confusion. And I don't think we're very confused. I think we're just very angry. Yeah. Um, Tara. Um, so this morning I was feeling um, a lot of fear of some um, humiliation and attack from a teacher in grade three. Yeah. And when I allowed myself to work through that, I kind of settled and then I had a lot of grief about a feel truth maybe of, um, oh, I'm actually allowed to make a mistake. Hmm. It's okay for me. Hmm. So that would be start to develop faith in yeah. the next mistake I make. I have more faith that it's okay to make a mistake. To make a mistake and not be punished. What is the only mistake from God's perspective? To sin. Yeah, to do something out of harmony with love or truth. That's the mistake. So so having not having knowledge is not a problem to God. You, you can know nothing and it's not a problem to God. Mm. Like a little baby knows nothing and yet God loves it. So you knowing nothing is not, a, not an issue. No, it's just the humiliation, like you said, that from you the world. get from you know, everyone else when you yeah. make a mistake. Yeah. So to, so to me, you're allowed to not know anything. I'm allowed to not know anything. We don't have to know everything. And in fact, it's impossible for us to know everything. Right? Impossible. It's going to be impossible for the rest of your existence to not know every, everything. Like you, you will not know everything for the rest of your existence. Hopefully, it will improve. You know, like you'll get to know more, but mm. but not everything, because only God knows everything, right? And and I, I think that's wonderful, because now I'm allowed to experiment with what I know. I'm allowed to make mistakes. The area where God's trying to correct us is no. He's saying to us, look, you're allowed to make any mistake you want, but when you're out of harmony with love or truth. I'm going, I've got laws that are going to correct you, right? But you're allowed to make any mistake you want to make. And, and to God, a mistake in knowledge is where we all are already. So for God, that's not a mistake. He actually created us without the knowledge. So he doesn't even see that as a mistake. Otherwise, he would have created us with all knowledge of the universe, stuck, you know, stuffed inside of us. <laughs> Wouldn't he? Yeah. He would have had the ability potentially to do that. I, I don't know whether he would or not, but, but the reality is, you know, if he's, if he's an infinite God, then he probably has the ability to do that, right? So, so why didn't he create us that way? He obviously created us the way he's created us because he, he, he built into us a desire to learn, the joy we get of learning. And most of us do have experienced that joy of different, at different times. That joy we receive of learning something new and, and discovering it for the first time and, and then acting upon it and realising it's true. You know, that, that kind of joy, would, if, if everything was stuffed into us <laughs> right at the beginning, we would never understand that joy, ever. 
this joy of discovery. And God's placed, as the Bible verse says, God's placed eternity into the heart of man so that he may never find out what the true God has done. You want me to say that again? God has placed eternity into the heart of man. In other words, he's created within you a desire to live forever. And then he said, then it says, so that you may never find out what the true God has done. In other words, you're never going to completely find out what God has done. That's why you need eternity. <laughs> right? And even then you still not completely find out everything God has done. And it's a way God created us. Now that comes from the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible. And, and the, the beauty of that understanding is that we realise, ah, I'm allowed to make mistakes. I'm allowed to discover new things. I don't have to know everything. And any person who projects at me that I should have known before I know is out of harmony with love. Right? So, you know, all those people get on Facebook and laugh at other people who don't know this and don't know that and all those people who, you know, you know, get on the media and laugh at other people. You know, they're way out of harmony of love because in the end of the day, we all don't know something. Or we could say it another way, we all know barely little, barely anything. <laughs> uh, but it's wonderful that that's the way God's created us. But when it comes to developing our faith, this is something we can do. We can choose to do it. It's a choice that we need to make. And, and it's something, like, a, it, honestly, it has such a large impact on the rest of your life that it, you'd be wise to do it. <laughs> you think it has a large impact on your physical life. You think of all the good things that come from you having some faith. Right. If you had no faith in electronics, you would not have electricity, you would not have a phone, you would not have light, you would not have power, you would not probably, for most of you, have hot water, you would not, you would not even be able to wash yourself in hot water, for that matter. Oh, I'm smelling that. And then, uh, you, you, you know, if you think of all the different, that's just with power. You wouldn't fly. You wouldn't be able to go to other ends of the world. You'd have to do it via a ship of some kind. But, but of course, there's all electronics in the ships nowadays, so you, you, know, you have to get an old technological thing like a, like a sailboat or something, right? which most of you couldn't afford, let's face it. And, and we just keep, if we just keep listing all of the different things that we couldn't do, how much more restricted would your life be right now just, just if you didn't have faith in electronics? Right. Now, if that's the benefits that can come from just having faith in one physical thing, what do you think the benefits are going to be by having some faith in some moral and spiritual and ethical things with, and faith with dealing with your emotions? The benefits must be greater given the fact that we're driven by our emotions. So there's got to be higher benefits than that. So this is what we need to contemplate. Monique, thanks. Uh, just following on from Tara's uh, question, then uh, are you saying that if we start removing each block mm -hmm. that I I have in my um, in my resistance to God, uh, faith in God, faith in truth, faith in all the laws, if yep. like there's like you said, it could take many many years. Like there might be like it could take years, but yeah. but not necessarily because remember a lot of them are to do with the fact that it's really just a lack of faith in our parents, or a lack of faith in other people, not God. So so the key is distancing, like pulling apart the relationship between God and people. Like we make them the same. That's part of our problem. But go on. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yes, yep. that's sort of what I was trying to get at, that if there's that brick wall of all of, I just see it as a brick wall that I've got maybe hundreds of uh, false beliefs about all these, about God, about truth, about yep. um, the universe. And then, and then if I start to take out one brick, like feel one emotion, yep. then, then that might build some faith Definitely, that, yeah. That, that, that one thing might be true that was untrue previously. 
Yeah, well, even the contemplation that it might be true is better than believing it's not when it could be, isn't it? It's like saying, it's like somebody coming to you and giving you a phone and say, look, you can dial that, and you say, no, nah, it's not true, you throw it away. You'd throw it away, wouldn't you? But if, if somebody gave you a phone and they said, you can dial that and you can actually talk to Alex, you'd go, you, when you initially contemplate it, you'd go, maybe they're right. I'll try it and see, all right? There's the difference between believing something that is untrue and believing in the potentiality of it being true, which is not the same as knowing that it's true. Once you've dialed it and you got Alex on the other end, then you'd know it's true, you see? And what I'm suggesting is we need to move from this, this instant dismissal that it's just untrue. Do you follow? So that's like breaking down our... like. Our These things. Just, and our justifications and all those those lies yep and actually breaking them down well actually like confronting them and actually testing whether they're true uh, whether they're actual lies or not and correct. not being lazy correct not just automatically believing they're true not just assuming they're true it, or, or untrue or untrue um, being yeah. lazy and, and accepting oh jesus said or aj says they're true so they must be true or yeah like, you're not going to accept it's truth if i say you're not exactly it's going to have to be a personal experience exactly and that and then there's no faith built if we're just all trusting you yep or there's no faith built if we're just trust if i'm just trusting my parents or the world or the world yeah no faith built there either and and nothing changes unless i actually start to pull a brick out and actually like Examine. do something with it correct all right and then you're saying that maybe then like i'll um then have one good experience and then i was that that, that might i might get a bit excited or, or, something or a bad like. experience do you reckon yeah but you see well <laughs> you will have either won't you because if you're measuring something that's new you will have a good or a bad experience or or you will have something happen which will at least inform you of the truth so the answer might be no it's not true or the answer might be yes this is true it could be either but at least be open to the possibility of it being either <laughs> so this is where you close down money yeah i do it's like yeah you like you're what you're saying to me up until that point yes spot on Everything you say to me is spot on. But the problem is you're not going to do it while you believe you only want to have a good experience. Um, yeah, I'm <laughs> you lost see to what that. I'm yeah. yeah. So you, you, and this is what the majority of us do, is, is we go, is it going to be pleasurable before I begin? I don't know. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is not do it. <laughs> I need to have a guarantee that it's going to be pleasurable before I begin. Can you give me this guarantee? And I say, no, I can't. I don't know what experiment you're going to engage and I don't know what the answer is going to be with some of these experiments that you engage. But, but wouldn't it be better that you know the truth than, than whether, the tr whether the truth is the answer is no or whether the truth is the answer is yes? Isn't it better to know it than not know it? It is. <laughs> I, I, but I'm blocked to even seeing what... Um, like, f Could you give an example on, on testing something that I could have a bad result? Well, that's exactly what Felix see. described the other day. You remember what he described? Oh, yeah. He went off and he decided, no, feeding addictions is good. AJ doesn't know what he's talking about. Feeding addictions is good. I'm going to go off and feed my addictions, see, but I'm going to measure the results this time. See, before I'm just ignoring the results, but I'm going to measure the results and see what happens. Measure the results. Yeah, it's not very good. So, so, so now there's a higher likelihood that what I've been told is true is true. So now what I can do is not feed my addictions and see what the results are. And, ah, oh, results are good. So that means feeding my addictions is not a good thing. And I know that now because I've tried it. Right? So, you've, so an answer to the negative or an answer to the positive is better than no answer at all, <laughs> is what I'm suggesting to you. And most of you want to only have the answers where, where you think in advance that everything's going to work out great. That's what you want. And that's what stops you from engaging the process of experimentation. Does that make sense? Paul, thanks. Um, the, um, the, 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 the trait of courage is such a big thing in all of this, I, I feel, and something which I see in yourself. And yep. 
and, um, and, and I guess the question is mixed with willpower and courage, you know, like... Um, to, to me, my courage has had to grow over years. Like, I wasn't very courageous a long <laughs> a while ago because I had a lot of fear, right? The more you release the emotion of fear, the more courage becomes present. And, and the more you don't listen to fear, the more courage becomes present. So I, I see, and we'll talk about fear later today and tomorrow a lot more, but I see a lot of you choosing fear and then wondering why you have no courage. Well, see, I still have fear. And to me, the, the courage and fear are not uh, linked to each other. Do, do, you, do we follow? To me, to me, you can have courage and still be in a lot of fear. You, you can choose to have courage even though you're afraid. In other words, you can choose to not use fear as your God anymore and in, instead choose to have love and truth as your God, even if God's not your God yet. Right? So, so you can choose a different God, love and truth, even if you don't believe in God at this stage. You can choose love and truth, that's my God now. And fear, whenever love and truth, I've got a choice between love and truth and fear, I'll always choose love and truth. You can choose that. It's a choice that you make, and you can have courage to make that decision even though you're very afraid. And if you're willing to feel your fear when you do it, it'll release the fear, and therefore the next time you do it, you'll have more courage and less fear. Right? So it's a positive growth then. And, I, and so I see, yes, the development of courage is an important quality. However, it is driven by my faith in love and truth. And in my case, for myself particularly, driven by my faith in God's goodness. That's why I have courage. I don't, it's not really something that I sort of feel within myself at to, uh, a lot of the time. I only have it because I have faith in God. Does that make sense? Like to me, it's, this is the trouble with self-reliance. If you, if you just rely on yourself, having courage is very hard. Very hard. Because now you're completely dependent upon your own limitations as to how much courage you will have. Whereas to me, God's an unlimited God with unlimited goodness. If I trust and have faith in God, now my courage will be dependent upon God's feelings, not my own. Now, to me, that means I can do anything. Does that make sense? No matter how afraid I am. Yeah. So these are, the, these are things we need to work our way through if we're going to work our way through this issue of your resistance to faith. All right, well, I've gone five minutes over, but, uh, but I think it's, it's good to understand what faith is, good to understand how we've been resisting the developing of it, and, and separate, like, stop using lack of faith as a justification for not having any. Do you understand? Stop sa saying to yourself, oh, my mum and dad did this, and I did that, and this person did that, and this person did this, and the world did that, and the world did this, and that's why I have no faith. No, it's not why you have no faith now. Why you have no faith now is because you don't want to develop any. And you've got reasons, what you believe are valid reasons, but I'm saying they're not, but you believe they are, valid reasons for not developing faith. And my suggestion to you is work through those reasons to see that they are false beliefs. They're not valid. They're false beliefs that you have about developing faith. You can deal with all of your emotion. You can feel all your anger and you can feel all your sadness. You can, it's great when everything changes. I love change. It's so wonderful. I'll be different. I like being different. Like, who wants to be the same as what the world is? Just end up with getting the same thing. And avoidance of attack, I just go, well, geez, if somebody wants to attack me, I can't control that. If they want to do that at some point, well, that's, what, that's their choice at the end of the day. Me trying to control them from doing it is like trying to tell you what to do with your life. I can't do that. So I, I give up that. I just go, okay, well, even if I'm attacked or not, I'm still going to have faith. All right? And once we get to this position where we're having faith and we want to develop our faith, and we'll talk a few days' time about developing any quality, how we go about doing that, but 
once we have once we've released a lot of these emotions and we want faith and we want to develop it and we we will do things to make sure that happens we will take action as monique said in her comment we will we will do things every day we won't be lazy about it we'll do things every day that motivate us to have some faith and grow our faith rather than just using our lack of faith and our resistance to faith as an excuse for what we choose to do in our life very good well let's have our 10 minute break thanks guys